uh, for the recording to come on. And it is now on. So, uh, Great. Siegel Fellow and now team member on the staff as the Siegel Program Management Associate uh, and uh, AmeriCorps alum and City Air alum. Uh, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Susie. Hey, everyone. Um, welcome to our January convening. Um, we try to provide opportunity for Siegel Fellows and the network to continue to grow in skills and professional development. And we just have the pleasure and great opportunity to have Max Cloud. I'm going to go give a general bio and then my experience with Max Cloud over my personal and professional development over the past few years. Um, but Max is a leadership development scholar. He lives in Boston. He's currently the Chief Program Officer at New Politics Leadership Academy, which is a nonprofit dedicated to recruiting and developing alum of national service programs to seek political office. He was also the Vice President of Leadership Development at City Year Inc., um, which is a national service program headquartered here in Boston, but really impact the lives of tons of young adults that were doing a year of service across the nation. And I had that opportunity in 2014 uh, to have that experience of an idealist, idealist journey to really reflect on what service meant to me and how do I measure my impact for my students as well as the impact that the students in service were giving to me. Um, through that, I was able to not only learn from the idealist journey, but also got to facilitate it and guide other AmeriCorps members through that journey. Um, this past fall, I went through another program uh, with New Politics Academy, um, answering the call. And now that I've done these years of service, and am I going to answer the call to promote the social justice to decide if I want to go into political office or do I want to be a political aide. So really, really appreciative to introduce Max Cloud. I'll pass awesome. Thank you, Bria. Thank you. Um, and it's wonderful to be with all of you. And uh, my, uh, I feel very connected to the Siegel Fellows. It's just uh, you guys are um, service people and I love hanging out with service people. So it's, uh, it's great to be with you all. So let me um, share my screen here. All right, everybody can see that? We're good? All right, so we're here to talk about leading with purpose. Um, let me make sure it's working. Are you going to work for me? There we go, okay. So a quick overview of the agenda. I wanna do some introductions and eager to hear who's on the call here. I'll give you some organizational context about the New Politics Leadership Academy. Um, some of you are very familiar with this, but I know for some of you it'll be new. And then um, we're gonna, give you an overview of the flame and the journey, uh, which is, you know, it's work that was developed at City Year and now that we've adapted for New Politics Leadership Academy, but it's a whole way of thinking about developing leaders through service um, that, you know, we refined at City Year and now we're trying to use it to develop uh, candidates and hopefully some elected leaders in the, in the years ahead. And I'll give you guys a chance to practice with a personal mission statement, which sounds like for some of you, this is going to be reviewing things you've done in three different contexts. Uh, and some of you, it might be a, a first time. And then we'll have some time to discuss it. So any questions about the agenda? Make sense? All right. So who are you? Where are you from? Why'd you become a Siegel Fellow? And one thing you hope to learn today. Anybody want to get us started on this? I can start. Awesome. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, I'm Sylvia Stewart. I am from everywhere because my dad was in the military, <laughs> yeah, um, okay. but I consider my home to be North Mississippi, Oxford, Mississippi. Okay. Um, I became a Siegel Fellow because I care about service and I believe that it can change even a region that has been backwards for a very long time and propel it into the future. Um, and I really hope to glean anything I can today. Um, I'm very open to learning anything. Okay, welcome. Elsa, can I pick on you? Very dim, it's very... Um... How about now? I might have to come down the work. Huh. Can you it is be now? It's better, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm Elsa, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. I just Hello, just because you know, service has always been part of my life, but also to meet other people with like thoughts of mine. So, meeting a bigger family that relates to giving back. And then, 
Something you hope to learn today? Hear me? Something you hope to learn today? Um, like learning new things. Um, probably try to be my field. I gave up on that and decided to go into education. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jess, how about you? I know you are uh, deeply immersed in all of this, but. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jess. I am calling in from New York. And uh, one of the things that I'm interested, uh, I guess why I became a Siegel Fellow is um, I heard Bill Clinton speak at Brandeis and felt like what he was describing was the person who I wanted to become. So I applied and hoped that the training would equip me to fill that role. Um, one thing that I'm hoping to learn today is just how different people come to this work. Um, I always learn something from listening to you, Max, and so I'm just hoping to learn a little bit of context in how this work is described to different groups of people. Great. And, you know, I'll say for Jess and for Bria, I know there's a couple of you folks who have participated in this in multiple contexts, so if you have any wisdom expertise, I invite you to uh, share your experiences as part of our learning here. So thanks. Anita, how about you? And Anita's actually in a place where video is hard for her, so she, she chatted in her oh. welcome. Uh, Anita Yip grew up in Boston and is currently in Framingham. She became a Siegel Fellow through applying through AmeriCorps alums and started an Asian women's giving circle to fill a need in philanthropy. And she was curious about defining her personal mission and really honing in on one thing because she feels like she gets pulled into different directions with interest. So Anita, thanks for sharing that via chat. Awesome. Bria, I know you've introduced yourself a little bit. One thing you hope to learn today. How about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I would like to learn is I'm continuously structuring my um, purpose and my own mission statement. So what's something that can make it even more specific as I continue um, a field in service? Great, great. And again, this will be a this will be a review for you. So hopefully a chance to uh, go deeper with that stuff. Who's our who's our um, five seven one person? That's Somebody call. Elsa. It's Elsa. Just oh, because that's because it was. A on the computer, so I just called in too. Okay, hang on. Uh, and I know Karen Sanchez was on with us earlier. She might have had to redial back in, um, but we'll keep an eye out if she joins back on. She's our newest Service Year Alliance Eagle Fellow down in DC and is a City Year and Peace Corps alum. Okay. Okay, did we miss anybody? That's everybody, right? Okay. All right, so a little bit of organizational context, so you know uh, kind of where I'm coming from organizationally. Um, <clears throat> here's the way we think about things at the New Politics Leadership Academy. We think we live in a really critical time. We think our politics is broken. Um, uh, you know, I don't think I have to make too much of a case of that. We just, you know, can barely keep the lights on these days. And uh, most people think Congress is really doing a terrible job. Um, so it's, we're, we're not in a good place politically. And here's our theory of change, really. This is a graph of the number of service veterans in Congress. And you can see that in the 1970s, we had about 75%. And these were obviously most folks who had done military service. Um, but in the years since then, we've had the you know, creation of AmeriCorps and all of that. But now, um, you know, in recent years, we're below 20% of members of Congress who have served. And then here's a graph of the number of bills passed per year by Congress. And, you know, they kind of track really well. You know, we can't say causation, but we, we think there's a real correlation here of uh, part of the reason our politics is so stuck and broken is because we have so few servant leaders in politics, people who have really made the life choice, as you all have, to serve the country and put country over party and um, learn all the things that you learn from a, a really intense service experience about what it means to serve a community and create change and work together with diverse peers and compromise and all of that important stuff. Um, so we know there's, you know, we, we work with military veterans as well as national service people. And there's 
two and a half million veterans who have served since 9-11. There's over a million AmeriCorps members. There's 230,000 returned Peace Corps volunteers. Uh, only a tiny number of these folks uh, currently pursue politics. And so we are trying to build a pipeline of these service alumni who are seriously considering answering the call. We just wanna bring a whole lot more of you guys into politics. And this is our theory of change, that we need more of these proven experienced servant leaders stepping up to engage in public service, either by seeking public office, you know, elected office themselves, or by working as campaign staff or policy advisors. You know, there's lots of ways to uh, enter politics without necessarily being the candidate. And we uh, support all of that. So our mission is to transform politics and reinvigorate our democracy by recruiting and electing servant leaders who have demonstrated the highest caliber of integrity, courage, and empathy. And you know, I will say we are bipartisan, um, and we think it's about leadership and it's about servant leadership. And just uh, if we had more of these types of leaders on both sides of the aisle, we could start uh, getting big things done again. So we are actually two sister organizations. I am part of the New Politics Leadership Academy, which is a 501c3, you know, a, a nonprofit. And we're about leadership development and education and um, all of that good stuff. And there's also an organization called New Politics, which is a 527, which has the legal status to get really involved in campaigns. Um, so, you know, we kind of create this pipeline leadership development experience. And then um, when people enter into active campaign mode, we kind of make the handoff to new politics. All right, and a little bit about what we've been doing is, um, you know, in 2016, which was, you know, already two years ago at this point, but we recruited 23 candidates. We had 16 primary victories and 13 general election victories. You can see that we support folks at all levels from the national level down to school board. Um, we, we want servant leaders at, at all levels. And we also know that um, you know, in the long term, 50% of Congress people come from the state level. Um, and of course, state level folks, it's not unusual for them to get started at the local level. So in the long term, we're just interested in creating a pipeline um, so that, you know, within, within a decade, we got a whole lot of servant leaders uh, at all levels and, and hopefully, you know, kind of stepping up into power at the highest level. And you can see that geographically, we're working all over the country. And what we're thinking about for the future is this year, 2018, we really wanna get six Congress people elected. Uh, we're supporting 20 congressional candidates. They are amazing human beings. Um, we're hoping to get six of them elected, 15 at the state level and six at the local level. And you know, our big goal is 20 by 20. Can we get 20 servant leaders into Congress by the 2020 election? And we just think, um, we're going to eventually start to hit a critical mass where uh, this really starts to shift the culture of that place where, you know, we just think it's reasonable to expect that there's real courage and integrity and empathy um, and commitment to service at the highest levels. And if we can create a community of uh, elected officials at the level, we can really start to shift things. Um, and then in terms of the academy, so, you know, we, we did a little pilot of this work. It was, you know, for those of you who did City Year, this was really an adaptation of the Idealist Journey work. And we adapted it in a, a small pilot in 2016. And then we did kind of a small scale pilot with three groups that had 43 participants. This past year that just ended was our first, really the first year that we tried to scale this thing up. And we ran 60 groups. We got 520 people through it. And this year, we are trying to more than double that hoping to get to 80 groups and fill those groups uh, uh, to a higher capacity than we did last year. But our goal is, uh, is 1,200 participants this year. Um, and the idea is, you know, we, let's just um, invite as many of you all, servant leaders, to spend some time really with this question of, do I feel called? And we, you know, our hypothesis that has now proved true is that a percentage of folks who step into that reflection space emerge just tremendously clear that they need to uh, they need to step up to politics to feel like they're living with integrity to themselves. So very exciting, and we want to just keep increasing the pipeline. Um, all right, I'm going to pause there. Any questions? Questions, comments? All make sense? Yep. Okay, hang on. We did also have uh, Karen join us again. I don't know if you were good with the introduction you got before. I just want to make sure you 
saw that she had joined on. Oh, that's Karen, our 629 person. Yep. Okay, I'd like to change the name so I know who's here. Excellent, okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's kind of, you know, the organization. So now let's dive into how do we think about leadership? And we think about it as a personal and collective learning journey. Um, and, you know, the question that we're asking is, am I called to serve through politics? And we just, you know, nobody can give anybody the answer to that. Each of us just has to look within ourselves and um, discern is the answer yes. And we know this, that politics, it's a really difficult path that each of us has to decide for ourselves whether we feel called to pursue this. And, you know, we recognize that the choices we have, the, the choice we make on this question has really profound implications, not only for our own lives and for the communities we serve, but also for the nation and the world. It's an important question. Um, so we make sure folks have time and space to think about it. And here's how we help people think about leadership, just how do you, you know, it's a question that's been like at the center of my career, is how do you even think about developing leaders uh, through a service experience? You know, the corporate world has all kinds of models and the nonprofit world has ideas and, um, but you know, as somebody who's done a lot of service programs and spent a long time at City Year, every time I saw those other models, I was like, they don't really fit us. Just service is such a powerful, holistic experience. We need our own way of talking about this. So what we came to was this flame. Um, and here's the image. Again, this will be very familiar to some of you, but for others, uh, it's a new way of thinking about leadership. And the key idea is it's got four elements and they all work together. And the first is the kind of the handle of the, the torch. And that's culture and values. That's, you know, about the organizational culture. So our, our values here at New Politics Leadership Academy, servant leadership, courage, integrity, empathy, democracy. That's everything we do is kind of animated by those values. And, you know, for participants in our programs, they're developed by being immersed in programs created by this organization. Um, so that organizational context is the first piece. And the second piece is the outer level of the flame. And this is do. And, you know, in this field of politics, it's campaigning and governing. In the field of service, it's about serving, you know, whatever your service is, whether it's in schools with city year or, you know, whatever you're doing out there, painting murals or um, growing food or whatever it is. Um, but there's what you do. But we know that everything that we do is influenced by a more internal level, which is what we know. And that's where training, education and coaching comes in. You know, all the skill building and competencies and, um, you know, whatever books you read, that sort of thing. Really important. Um, I will say, I, you know, when I got to City Year, I felt like City Year was really good at, at these three things, as are a lot of organizations, but there was a fourth and final piece that was missing that we had to be more systematic about, and that's this innermost B level of the flame. How am I being, you know, and it, it, it goes deeper than knowledge, and it's kind of about identity, and we really needed um, a way to intentionally develop people at that level. And, you know, all of this works together, these four elements, they're integrated, they're comprehensive, they're all important. And in an ideal approach to leadership development, you're really thoughtful and intentional and powerful with all of these four things, and you do them all in a really integrated way. Okay. So answering the call, just like the idealist journey, it develops this B level of the flame. Like we're very clear, this is not an information transfer session. This is not a technical training. It's not a how to we are trying to engage people at that B level of the flame. So what does that even mean? Um, it's the innermost level of the flame. It's about identity. And implicit in this is this understanding that everything that we do and all that we know is really an expression of who we are. So everything flows from that innermost place, that kind of deepest place in ourselves. And here's the thing, that who we are right now on this training on Friday at lunchtime, it's really just a moment on the journey towards who we might become. Um, and so with that consciousness, we offer an invitation. And I have to say, I've learned the hard way. You cannot compel anybody to do inner work. Uh, you can't force this on anybody, but we can offer a very sincere invitation. So I will offer you the invitation I've now offered to probably tens of thousands of core members and at this point hundreds of uh, servant leaders contemplating politics. And this is to undertake an inner journey of personal exploration. 
And this work is really inspired by Joseph Campbell, who um, he was a comparative mythologist. He studied ancient mythology and all around the world and his work inspired Star Wars and a whole lot of other modern Hollywood blockbusters. And he basically said, there's one universal story of transformation that we tell over and over again. And at its most basic, it's got three levels, uh, three stages. And the first is departure, where you leave behind a kind of the familiar ordinary world you know of, and you head off into a, a future that you don't understand, an adventure shrouded in mystery. And the heart of the journey is the road of trials. And that's where you are tested and challenged. And um, in confronting those tests, you change the world. But also in confronting those tests, you discover within yourself hidden resources of courage and wisdom and skill and strength that they were always there, but you would have never been able to access them if you had not been challenged to do so by the journey. But that's never the end. The story never ends when you, you know, metaphorically slay the dragon. The story ends with a return where you um, get all these gifts from the journey, these, uh, uh, these gifts from your struggles, and then you find a way to go home and use all that you've learned to be in service to others. And, you know, City Year, the idealist journey was an attempt to uh, make sure that every core member understood their year of service through this framework. And now at New Politics, we're, we're saying that a campaign is very much a hero's journey. It is very much a uh, leave your familiar, comfortable, ordinary life and then, <laughs> you know, step into a very... Uh, you know, kind of aggressive, uh, often ugly context in which you are struggling for power, you know? Um, but ultimately it's about to use whatever you gain from that to be of service, ideally from elected office. But even if you don't, even if you don't win your election, you still get all these just uh, insights and uh, experiences and you can still serve, you know? Um, so it's a, a kind of an overall framing for everybody to keep in mind. Um, and what we always say is that we can only illuminate the path. It's really up to each of us to choose to undertake this, this journey. You know, this, this, especially this inner dimension of the journey, it's possible to go through an AmeriCorps year, a city year, years in the military, a, a campaign without ever kind of being present to this inner dimension of what's going on, to just let it happen without your conscious awareness. Or you can choose to really kind of proactively own that piece of work. Um, so that's what we're inviting people to do. I'm going to pause there. Comments or questions? Thoughts or reactions? Is it making sense to folks? Yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. All righty. Okay. So it's time to actually do the journey. Time to get this started. And the place we always start, and again, I know for some of you, this is going to be like your 20th time through this, um, but it's something that always merits revisiting. We always start here with crafting a personal mission statement. And here's the instructions we give. It should begin with the phrase, my mission is, no more than three to six sentences long. You know, if it gets to seven sentences, that's okay. The, the point is we're really distilling an essence here. We're not writing an essay. This should not be a four page. Um, you know, essay about everything you've ever thought about. It's really, what is the essence of my mission? And it shouldn't be about specific tasks or quantifiable goals. I want to, you know, run three times a week, or I'm going to serve 40 students this week, or, you know, City Year in particular was really good with these goals, and they're important, but this is different. Um, this is an invitation to think about stuff you're always working towards, but will never fully complete or achieve. And that's because we're, we're invited to think about who do you want to be, not really what do you want to do. And the idea here is that we're each larger than any role we currently hold or position we fill. And this is an invitation to connect with that deepest sense of purpose. And the story I always like to tell here is, um, does anybody know how Rosa Parks paid her bills? Does anybody know what her profession was? Any guesses? Nobody? She was a seamstress. And I always think, you know, somewhere there was an org chart that had seamstress and Rosa Parks' name could have been put into this seamstress thing and she had these skills and competencies of being a seamstress and I'm sure she was good at it. But then how relevant was all that skills and competencies to her decision to not give up her seat on the bus? 
right? And the idea here is we, we have jobs and there's things we do and hopefully we're good at them, but there's a deeper dimension of who we are and that really matters for this kind of civic leadership. And so there's an invitation to connect with that deepest part of yourself. So questions, comments, does it make sense to folks? Yeah? All right, so I'm gonna give you, oops, sorry. I'm gonna give you four minutes. Give it a try, see what you can come up with. And you know what, we'll give you five. Take five minutes and uh, try and craft your mission or revisit a mission that you've crafted in the past and then we'll have some time to discuss. Cool? I had a quick question. Yeah, great. Um, so what if you have like multiple missions? Like do I connect them to one? Um, why do you have multiple missions? Explain that to me. <laughs> It's not multiple missions. See, this is gonna sound silly, but I always say like my goal in life is to be a super a superwoman and to save everything and everyone. So like my main focus is like education, women empowerment, um, like and like in my job currently, I do a bit of everything that my mission, like my I feel like my purpose is. Like how do I do I narrow it down to one specific you know, thing? Education, women's empowerment, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's my family. Um, they are, um, those are like careers that yeah. you can express your mission through those things, but your mission okay. can be deeper. And I, you know, ideally it's a kind of a way of being that you would express in whatever issue you choose to apply yourself to. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Yeah. You know, like if you feel like you're a different person in the education field, than you are in women's empowerment, then you probably just haven't gone deep enough to what is the what is the essential piece that expresses itself in all of those ways. Make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? It's a good question. All right, let's give it a try. Five minutes, go for it.
A minute and a half left. Okay, that's five minutes. Um, no worries if you didn't finish. It's not a tremendous amount of time to uh, distill the essence of your purpose in life. But how was it? What was that like? Easy, hard, fun, refreshing, terrifying? I don't know. It's hard for me. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> No, go ahead. It's okay. Uh, it was hard for me to distill all of the things that I think about that I'm working towards and that I care about down into just like a handful of sentences. Hard to get at the essence. Take some work. Yeah. Elsa, what were you going to say? I was going to say it was like a mix of all the different emotions. Like I was excited to finally put something down in words because I'm really big on writing what I want. But then I was like nervous and like, oh my God, I don't know how to narrow this down, like how to express what my mission really is. But then when I actually like, I think I have a mission, um, I think like it was just exciting to finally see, put everything together. Yeah, I think that's pretty typical of like, there's initially this like, Whoa! you know, like, w w w and then if you sit with it, you realize there's a, I can actually express this. Great. Other this folks. The, this is the first time I've done it. This is Susie. Um, really? I found it interesting for, my, for myself. I feel like I've helped other people do it. That balance between what I want to do versus what I want the result to be and what I want to see in the world, how to balance fitting those two in or just sticking with the first part. That was, that was where I was working hard in my brain. Yeah. Yeah. This is Karen. Um, so I, I remember, I remember doing this when I was a city year core member mm -hmm. and, um, now that I'm, you know, five years out of that, I think that, um, it was really interesting to remember doing it and kind of like remembering some like key points. So my mission was very different, but, um, I still like really passionate about working with children, but it's changed to like very, a different mission, I guess, a different purpose, but yeah. it's still working with children and youth. You know, this is one of the powerful things about missions. If you if you articulate these, then a couple of years down the road, you can look at it and get this insight that you've changed. You know, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Nothing, no no rule that you have to live the same exact mission year over year. Um, mm -hmm. But the problem is if we just ignore it for a year or a decade or a lifetime, 
So thank you. Mm -hmm. Other folks. Bria, can I ask you, it's always challenged by choice, but uh, somebody who's done this in multiple different situations. Hi. Um, yeah, so this is actually very interesting and I'm open to share, um, but going through it this time, um, so I, I just found out some not so great news about one of my students. So I'm um, wow. a little emotional. Uh, but how much power? Um, no, this is fine. Because okay. whatever just, you want, whatever you want. Okay. Um, it gave more power to my personal mission statement. Uh, and sometimes when we do personal mission statements, it's like I'm reliving um, reliving moments. But this is the first time. It's just like. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I appreciate this because there was even a sentence in here is my own continuous growth in developing other people and developing youth uh, to make sure their voices are heard. So I don't know. This is just, it was a, supposed to happen this way. So I really appreciate huh. it. Okay. Uh, I wish you all the best with whatever is going on over there. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, Bria, thank you, and please take care of yourself. Absolutely. Um, I think Bria's going to maybe sign off. Okay. Um, Go do what you got to do. Um, we send our warm thoughts to you, Bria, and feel free to, to sign off. I'll check in yeah. with you a little bit. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, but we did get, uh, I'll, ch I'll check in with her later. We did get a chat in from Anita uh, to the group, and she said, it was difficult to expound on the mission, the B part of the flame. Anybody else uh, want to offer thoughts? Jess, can I pick on you? You want to offer some thoughts? Sure. I mean, I think for me, it's always a challenge, but this time it actually felt like serene because I wasn't thinking about the content, but rather the process or the context. Hmm. So. For me, it was just like my mission is to be in social capital and to be a mirror towards others and reflect their own essence back to them. Um, and I think in that way, maybe I shirk the responsibility of what my true mission is, but it was a different approach. I just tried to say like, not what is the content or the issue that I'm really passionate about, but the process and the way that I want to engage with the world and the people around it. So that was my approach this time Love around. Love that. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, challenged by choice. Is there any brave soul willing to share what they wrote? Recognizing it's a, it's a vulnerable thing and you only had five minutes to craft this? <laughs> I'm happy to, uh, I shouldn't ask you to do what I wouldn't do. So my leadership mission is to practice courage and compassion in honoring and helping others to honor the sacred interdependence of our world. And if you catch me not doing it, you can let me know about it. Would you be willing to say that one more time? It's very powerful. Uh, my leadership mission is to practice courage and compassion in honoring and helping others to honor the sacred interdependence of our world. Let's see, Anita just posted hers. My mission is to, uh, where we go? My mission is to leverage data analysis so others can discover insights about themselves and or the world. Boom, very clear. Thank you, Anita, appreciate your sharing. Anybody else feel moved? So I might have done this wrong, but here's mine. Mm -hmm. um, so my mission is to work to create a Mississippi that works for everyone. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what you do, all people deserve a state that represents them and where they can thrive. I want Mississippi and other Southern states to go from last in all measures and well-being to first and to lead the nation in a system of government that not only serves its residents, but has a genuine care for them. Boom. Why do you think you didn't do that, right? What do you, 
it's more. Well, it just seemed too, too unreflective of me. I don't feel like it, it was too result oriented instead of reflective of like, I mean, I honestly like making a better Mississippi is one of the most important things to me, but it doesn't reflect any kind of self-development. Yeah. You know, if, if, if we were coaching here, I would say, you know, it's powerful, but I would invite you to think about what are some ways of being that you want to aspire to as you pursue that outcome. Um, which is not to say, you know, you should take that out, but um, there is a question of how do you want to be as you do it. Anybody else feel moved? Anybody else willing to share? Um, I can try. <laughs> oh, I was still working on mine, but it says, my mission is to be the voice and the advocate for children and women by helping them understand their purpose in life. I want to help those around me at their lowest find their strengths and keep them motivated to keep the positive cycle going. Powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Did you feel like you got past the multiple missions there that uh, kind of gets yeah, it? I think I got all of them. All right. Awesome. Awesome. I do think, you know, this work is a quest for inner wholeness. And if we feel like we're scattered, like we're compartmentalized inside of ourselves, we haven't gotten all the way to the, the integral whole within ourselves. And if we haven't found it within ourselves, we can't create it outside of ourselves. And so we create this world that is disconnected and divided, you know, um, and, and it's a reflection of our inner condition unless we do that kind of work. So congrats on that. And thank you for sharing it. And I hope you can see how it kind of feels like I can just be this no matter what I, you know, what context I'm in day to day, I'd still just wake up and do this. Great. Um, any thoughts on, well, anybody else feel moved? Any thoughts on hearing peers, colleagues share their mission statements, thoughts or reactions? What does it do for you? This is just, I mean, I think it's like both inspiring and very humbling. Like that was not the way that um, I expected. And so it's nice to kind of see that this is the milieu, like that these people are taking who they are and their essence seriously and conscientiously exercising it. Because I feel like if I don't know my own mission, then I'm definitely not doing it. So it was exciting to hear people verbalize like what it is that they are and who, what that being is, as Anita was talking about. Yep. Yep. Other thoughts, reactions? Jess, I think you hit on a great word with humbling. For me, I was inspired, but also humbled just to know the power of where each of you are coming from and what drives you. It was really a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, I feel very grateful to do this job and just kind of constantly encounter this commitment to purpose in this, in this community of servant leaders. Um, and just what would our world look like if more folks in power you know, showed up from this place and were really clear and committed to living in integrity with it. We also got one more chat in from Anita. Um, she liked Sylvia's statement how it was both a high level vision and very specific, and she felt a passion in other statements as well. Absolutely. You know, even, even over the video call, and that's it, it's, uh, it's powerful stuff to say. And what do you think our communities would look like if each of us woke up and lived our mission every day? What would that do? Thoughts on that? It can be well, a little specifically bit. Specifically, mine, I feel like if I did my mission every single day, like all of the students, like, you know, kids would, and families would see the importance of education. And we would see higher graduation rates. We would see more kids graduating college. You'll see more people, you know, fulfilling their dreams and actually chasing them instead of, you know, having to find other routes to get them there. 
Nice. You know, this is the power of the flame. This is why, uh, you know, when you start to see that connection between when you live with clarity and integrity to your own deepest sources of purpose, your capacity to serve others uh, is enhanced and strengthened. And so there's this very clear connection between our own inner work and the work we do to serve others. And, you know, one reason why I'm so committed to bringing this to service programs is because I think in a lot of service programs, there's kind of a um, very implicit and powerful but completely unexamined belief that if we turn away from the people we're serving, we are abandoning the work of service. So if we turn to look inwards, we're not about the kids we're working with or the communities. And uh, so we just shouldn't do that. Like, um, it, it, it's very countercultural to open up spaces for kind of personal growth and reflection in service programs because it's so focused on serving others. But I just think it's a mistake. Uh, it's a misunderstanding of how um, how things work to think that you, you can't ever focus on your own development. Um, you just have to always be focused on serving others because eventually in serving others, you hit the limits of your current capacities and you need to grow beyond those limits so that you can achieve a higher level of impact. Make sense? It almost reminds me of like the radical love idea. Like, can you really love someone else before you love yourself? Right. And can you really serve others before you know how to be of service to yourself? And I also want to make sure that we're seeing the questions that come in on the chat. Um, and Anita, please feel free to type back if I'm not getting the sentiment across. But I have a question about this. This seems like a feel good question. And have people ever brought up if there were too many cooks in the kitchen, per se? Um, personal mim mission statements that don't necessarily encompass others. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I do have to say, if we had more time, I could lead you through the shadow mission exercise, which is the dark, the, the dark side of a mission. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's something I brought into city year in my last couple of years. And now that's integral to what we're doing at new politics, but every light casts a shadow and we don't really understand ourselves if we don't, uh, understand the shadow that, uh, we all have because light and shadow go together. Um, so I do think there is a, um, there's power to seeing the dark side of all of us. Um, so, you know, it's part of a, a deeper process um, is to go beyond this, just the positive stuff to see the negative stuff that is always associated with the positive stuff. Um, but then the too many cooks in the kitchen, um, I, I think the world would be transformed if every single person was really clear about their mission and woke up with integrity. This is not about people being in charge or having too many, you know, too many, too many people telling other people what to do. It's about moving from some, uh, either having no clue about what your mission is or just allowing it to live in some vague amorphous shape that does not really drive behavior um, or does not really focus your energy and moving to something really clear. And I just think everybody in the organization, everybody in the community, everybody in the society should um, do the work to get to greater inner clarity about what contributions they wanna make. Um, because it's not really about who's in charge and do we have too many people in charge. There should be nobody who's just kind of a soulless, obedient, conformist soldier um, just listening to what somebody else is telling them to do. That is not an ideal outcome. I hope that answers your question, Anita. Any other questions, comments about any of this? Thoughts? Reactions we will kind of shift from, you know, debriefing the exercise to a overall questions about this approach and this work. I kind of wonder what the next step is like with the topic of leading with purpose. Like this seems to be knowing your purpose and then how do you activate it? Um, at least for me from a very personal space, it's like that shadow is very real or the perception is very real or not being sure if this iteration of the mission statement is accurate to encompass everything kind of like how do you move after you sit with this towards the next step and what is that next step well one of the reasons why i love doing this in the context of service you know whether it's uh, you know it was city or now it's people who are campaigning or getting ready to campaign is you know, I think leadership development detached from service can be narcissistic. Like I've, I've been involved in a lot of personal growth activities. There can be an element where it's, it's just narcissism. It's just like, 
um, I've crafted my beautiful mission and, and, and I'm not doing anything for anybody else. I'm just focused on my own dragons to slay and my own work to do. Um, but I've also been part of service programs that uh, ignore this personal development completely. And then it's just people are burning out and um, hitting the limits of what they can do. And, you know, this idea of while you are trying to serve others, you are awake to this. Um, am I leading with integrity? And every day I'm faced with these challenges and I'm doing this work and every day is a chance for me to kind of push myself to both get more clarity and um, summon the courage to live with more integrity. That's a really powerful thing to be in the work, trying to serve others while also being mindful of this is kind of the, the most transformational place to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of retreats where you can go to some conference center or a mountaintop for a few days and have all kinds of powerful things. And then it's just this big question of, so how does this matter for anybody outside of yourself? Um, but to be doing it consistently while serving others, that's a unique way of approaching this. Other comments or thoughts? So I have kind of a similar thought. Um, yeah. So what's running through my mind right now is where do we move from believing in something and having a mission to do something to actually executing it? Like in, in the vast world of life happening and just our own human circumstances, like yep. where, where, where do we execute? Where is, how do we make that a reality instead of just a belief? Well, you know, a reason why I, again, love working with service people is like, you guys are doing this already. You know, you're working at Farm Aid and folks are, you know, already trying to make change. The trick is just for folks who are in the world that way, can we make sure that, that we illuminate this innermost work and help people stay focused on it consistently? Because um, you guys are already doing it, you know? Now, now, if you do this work and you feel like I'm really out of integrity, I'm not doing the work I'm supposed to be. Uh, that's, you know, an important insight to start figuring out. Um, but I think more often with servant leaders, like the folks who show up at the Siegel Fellows, you, you guys are really already doing the work out there. The question is just, are you as present to the inner journey and this inner dimension of the work as you, you should be um, to, to, to be kind of developing to stay at your edge so that you can be at maximally of service to others. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do think there are people out there who are just, um, they're way off. They are, they are in careers that are really not meaningful to them. And they really feel like their lives are not at all connected to uh, meaningful work. And I find that's not usually the case in the service world. Um, but there is a possibility to kind of uh, take it to the next level for servant leaders to really get clear on this and, um, build this practice of personal growth in to strengthen their commitment to their ability to serve others. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Good questions, folks. Anything else? We got a, another minute or two. Final questions. All right. Well, let me, uh, I have one closing quote I can share here that I like to share. Um, so thank you for doing this and questions. And then I found this quote that I just love, that no human is great enough or wise enough for any of us to surrender our destiny to. The only way in which anyone can lead us is to restore to us the belief in our own guidance. And I just love that idea of, you know, leadership is not telling people what to do, it's reconnecting them to their own inner compass. Um, and it's really the work uh, I was doing at City Year, and now very excited to think about what it would look like to bring that to politics. Um, and I hope you guys found it helpful. How about, can we do a quick whip around? One, one idea you'll take from this, one insight you'll take from this, and then we'll sign off. Anybody willing to get us started? This is Susie. I, oh, go ahead, Elsa. Uh, I was going to say, one thing I did take from this is the whole leadership flame. Um, you know, trying to figure out your mission and, you know, your purpose. And I think you know, working with AmeriCorps members, myself, um, you know, maybe I might do this as a project with my team, 
to like figure out what their mission is now that you know they're getting ready to prepare for life after AmeriCorps. Love it. You know, I do have to say, just being able to say um, we're focusing on the B and for everybody to understand that was like suddenly people have a framework for talking about something that's so important but also so amorphous and uh, it just gives people a way to, to talk and think about stuff that is central to AmeriCorps but also has been tricky to talk about. So thank you for that. And yes, go for it. Susanna, Susie, you were about to jump in. Oh, I was just going to get us started if people were still thinking, but I um, really appreciate you taking the time to bring this concept to uh, fellows who have not heard it before, people like myself who haven't, but also to, to re have those who have think about our mission uh, in an activity for one of our cohort meetings last week. We were just doing a little bit more on the, the personal sense of what's um, driving us, but in a less focused way. And I really like the way that this this brings mission together with the personal connection and the forward motion. So really want to thank you for this. Great. Great. Sylvia, how about you? Um, for me, it was nice to kind of reorient my vision to the B, because I know the importance of, of being to a mission and to making a difference in the world. But I mean, lately I've gotten so bogged down in just the doing and the execution instead of the being. So it was great to really move the camera back. Yep. The yeah, and that's the whole idea. Is, uh, it, it's so easy to get focused on the, your to-do list and the urgency and the stuff and to just every now and then have a chance to step away from that and turn inwards is an important practice. Thank you. Jess, how about you? Um, I, you know, we say in LA that there's like smog and smut, but that the buildings behind it are still there. And I think that in that hmm. analogy, I'm thinking of like, this is who we are. This is at least like my being, but can I see it? Can I move away the smog and see it more clearly so that I know that it's there as opposed to just feeling it, but not quite understanding it. I have never heard that metaphor used, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anita, how about you? Can you type something in for us? And while we're waiting, Elsa? Something you'll take? Oh, and I think, Elsa, you had gone first. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Switch through and see if... I can go with Karen. Sorry. Uh, so something that I will take away out of this is just the idea that you can live your your mission or your purpose every day and live it with integrity and with a clear like mission of who you are, uh, who and where who you want to be in the future. And so like living day to day gives you the steps to like get to your like future self and like your ideal like. <laughs> A future and so that's something that I will um, constantly think about and, and I'm also like very curious to like think about like what's my dark side and figure out you know what are some like negative things that I have that can like prevent me from like my mission. I will tell you um, if you want to figure out your shadow mission just yeah. look at your mission and articulate the choice you make if you don't choose your mission. You know if you choose to spread love what does it mean to withhold love? If you choose to work for justice, okay. what does it mean to choose apathy? Um, and pretty quickly you can articulate uh, what does it look like if you uh, choose not to lead from your mission and that's how you okay. end up in your shadow. Gotcha. And it's, uh, Perfect, thank you. It's a very uncomfortable thing to look at, but you should go like, oh yeah, I know that person. I don't like that person at all, but I know that. <laughs> There's that. Cool. And we, did, right. get a, we did get a chat in as well. Yep. Yeah, and you know, I gave you guys five minutes to do this. That's not a lot of time. Uh, I do invite you, if you feel like you didn't quite get it finished, to keep working on it until you feel like you have a um, something that really is true for you for right now. So thank you. I know we're at a time boundary. I hope this was helpful to you all. Always an honor and a, and a pleasure to reconnect with the Siegel Fellows. And um, Susie has my email. If any of you want to reach out to me, I'm, I'm happy to be a resource. Cool? Great. Thank, thank you, you so much, Max, for your time and your wisdom today. Um, and thank you everybody for participating, chatting in, uh, videoing in, phoning in, and thank you, Max, for the offer. I will share your email with those who yep. are on the call. So um, we can all stay out of our shadows and, and focus exactly. on our being and our mission. And I hope everyone has a great rest of the day. So awesome. thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you.